Ella P. Stewart is remembered by your generation as the namesake of this school on Avondale Avenue. But your great grandparents' generation remembered her from a very different place not so far away. Right over here at the corner of Indiana and City Park. 50 years ago, right here was the site of Stewart's Pharmacy. Ella P. Stewart owned and operated this place. She was one of the first licensed African American women as a pharmacist in the entire United States. And her store was more than a place where you got your prescription filled. This place right here was the heart and soul of the Pinewood Door neighborhood. From the 1920s, the Door Street Corridor, the Pinewood neighborhood, was Toledo's most storied African American neighborhood. Today, we're gonna to talk about the Great Migration, which brought so many African American families to Toledo and made our city a better place. If you were making a Mount Rushmore of the four greatest Toledoans in the city's history, Ella Stewart is the first or second person you're putting on that mountain. So let's talk a little bit about the forces that brought Ella Stewart and tens of thousands of other people to Toledo. It starts with the idea of urbanization. Urban, of course, means city, and urbanization is cityfication, right? Places becoming cities. This trend had started way back in the late 17, early 1800s. Cities were already growing. But the period that we really look at as urbanization is from the 1880s, 1890s, going through to the present day. From the 1890s, when we look at all the people who moved into cities, they all moved for the same reasons. Jobs. There were jobs for women that they couldn't get in their small towns or their farms. Immigrants that they couldn't get back home. And internal migrants, people from around the United States, especially in rural areas, who felt there was no opportunity in the rural area and they wanted the opportunities that they could find in the cities. Now, this is going to transform the cities because prior to this, cities were what you might call monocultural. Um, and now they're becoming multicultural. Uh, if you look at Toledo, for example, before the 1880s, Toledo is more than 75% German and Irish. It's those two cultures and that's it, okay? It's not a diverse city and that's gonna change. So when we look at why it changes and how it changes, we look at two things. We look at push factors and pull factors. Push factors are the things that push you out of one place. Pull factors are the things that pull you into another. Push factors for people who migrate and move all over the world, they're very similar. Why do you leave a place? Discrimination, violence, low paying jobs, lack of opportunity, lack of political participation, natural disasters. Those are the reasons people leave a place. And when we look at why African-American people left the South, you can check every one of these boxes. Was there discrimination in the South? Absolutely. Now that's not to say, please let's be very clear. It's not to say there was no discrimination in the North because there was absolutely discrimination in the North. Um, but the, the violence associated with the discrimination in the South was something that's a push factor out of the South. Low paying jobs of jobs at all. In the South, you had the sharecropper system. And as you are well aware from earlier in your class, the sharecropper system kept people poor. Um, and there were really no opportunities for an African-American person to pursue other careers in the South. Lack of opportunity in general kind of comes back to that. If you were a young African-American person and you want to be a cop or a teacher or whatever in the South, forget about it. Those avenues are more or less closed to you. Um, and then, and I should be clear, uh, at least for African-American teachers, there were some positions available in the South um, at the segregated schools. Lack of political participation. As has been well established, black people have been denied the right to vote in the South for a very, very long time. And finally, natural disasters. Natural disasters here. Um, there are some that are like uh, boll weevil infestations that make it difficult to crop, to share crop, and th that's going to hurt people. But the big one is the 1927 Mississippi River flood, and if you ever have a chance to read about it, I really encourage that you do. It was this really transformative moment in American history in the Mississippi Delta, and it really, it really changed the course of American history. So, what are the pull factors? What's bringing people here? Well. Generally speaking, it's like opposite day when you're in third grade. You remember opposite day. I love you. <laughs> Means I hate you, right? 
or I hate you means <laughs> I love you. Um, pull factors are almost always going to be the opposite of the push factors. Very few people in this world are going to be like, man, this country is terrible. It's so violent. I'm going to move to someplace more violent. People typically, if they are in a place of violence, try to get to a place away from violence. In a place of discrimination, get to a place away from discrimination. In a place with joblessness, go to a place with jobs. I've talked about it before in this class. Think about yourself, your own family. You've moved for certain reasons, right? You've moved because mom got a job in this new place or this other side of town, so we moved to that side of town. It's it's not that much different for us than it was for people back then in the underlying push and pull. So why do people come to a place? Chance of more tolerance, um, better paying jobs, opportunities for land ownership, job advancement, chance of participating participating in the political process. These are all reasons that black people come from the South to the North and to places like Toledo, Ohio. Rapid growth of the black community in Ohio over a 40 year period. In 1900, in the entire state of Ohio, there were only 90,000 African-American people counted in the census. 20 years later, the numbers doubled and then some to 190,000. And then it nearly doubles again by 1940 with 340,000 African-American people in the state of Ohio. We'll look at Toledo's numbers in just a minute. But this is just to give you an idea that this great migration, we're not we're not just making stuff up. This is really a huge transformative time. When black people came to the North, they very often came to cities that were what we call redlined. Now, the phrase redlining doesn't get really used until the 1960s. And the redlining with the map that you see behind this slide, which is a map of the city of Toledo, um, and the red boxes are where in the 1930s, the Home Ownership Loan Corporation uh, allowed African-American people to buy homes. Um, these were places where they, they wouldn't make typical loans and they served as a form of segregation in the North. Um, there were formal bank policies and formal government policies that restricted which parts of a city black Americans could purchase homes and land. What did this do? Well, first of all, let's all agree that's freaking terrible, right? It's really bad that you've got government and banks saying, yeah, if you're of this group, you can only live in this place. That's a universally bad thing, all right? But what does it also create? It creates sustainable neighborhoods. Um, when redlining concentrated black people into certain neighborhoods, what it kind of guaranteed was that there was going to be a self-contained economy in that area. And this is something that, again, the causes of it are really, really bad. But this one effect that it creates, if you've crammed all of the African-American people into this one overcrowded neighborhood, if I am one person in that neighborhood who says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open up a small grocery. All of a sudden, I've got lots of customers around me, right? Hundreds, if not thousands of customers within a couple blocks. And I'm going to be able to make a living as a grocer. And another person says, I'm going to open up a, uh, a hair salon here. I'm going to open up a barbershop. And those people are going to now be able to make a living doing something for the community. And somebody says, you know what we need here? We need a bowling alley or a movie theater or whatever. It's going to be the birth of the black middle class in the North because these neighborhoods so concentrated, so crowded, are going to be able to sustain the first real level of black owned businesses in places like Ohio. And this is an enormous turning point moment in America's history. I cannot state that strongly enough. The birth of the black middle class is the birth of a thriving black community in so many cities across the North. So let's kind of take a look at where that was in Toledo. Up and down Doris Street near today's Mott Branch Library were black owned businesses of every kind you can think. Groceries, barber shops, theaters, clothing stores, and restaurants. They made this neighborhood around Dora and Pinewood not just a thriving place, but the heart of Toledo's black middle class. So just a few blocks away from Mott is where we started our entire video today. Um, what you're looking at in this picture right above me here um, is Stewart's Pharmacy. This is LP Stewart's Pharmacy. Um, you see the Coke sign out back, the uh, 
the um like billboard painted on the wall and everything um the front windows of the store there's the coke sign drugs film candy soda you know it was a full service shop for the community uh over there at uh, city park in indiana um cities throughout the north develop black neighborhoods just like our pinewood neighborhood or door street corridor whichever you prefer to call it the rise of the black middle class as with the rise of every middle class creates new jobs and new avenues for discretionary income. So when we talk about discretionary income, we're talking about the ability to now buy a book, to go to a movie, to buy a record, to get that radio and tune in uh, music that appeals to you. This is what's already been changing large swaths of America. And now the black community is wrapped right up into all of it. That is going to lead to what we often call the Harlem Renaissance. And if there's one thing, it's my bottom point here on this list, but it's the number one thing I want to get across to you. The Harlem Renaissance didn't just happen in Harlem. Obviously, there is one facet of this nationwide African-American Renaissance that happens in Harlem, but the same kind of things that happened in Harlem happened everywhere, including Toledo, Ohio. It was an intellectual, social, artistic blossoming in the African-American community. Black authors uh, of both um, nonfiction and fiction books and poetry and prose are going to be able to really get their careers jump started. Visual artists, people like painters and, and other kinds of, of visual media artists are going to have opportunities they've never had before. Actors, we're going to see black theater have a blossoming in the 1920s. Musicians, obviously, this is generally the, the top line when people think about the Harlem Renaissance is jazz music. Um, they're all gonna find audiences for their work. And again, when we think about the nature of a neighborhood with lots of people with similar backgrounds and similar interests together, it's creating a really concentrated audience for these people with artistic talent. Um, the other kind of facet of this is that Black intellectuals are going to have a chance to do things they've never had a chance to do before. Um, they're able to collaborate with each other because especially in Harlem, lots of black intellectuals are living within 30 blocks of each other, um, interfacing with academic and political establishments the way they haven't been able to before. In the past, if you were a black intellectual, black writer, uh, black academic in the South, the chances of you being able to communicate with somebody in Washington or New York, the cultural and political capitals of the United States was really slim. Now you're right there. And that's going to be an enormous difference. Okay. Um, as I said, it didn't just happen in Harlem. Um, in Toledo, you had black owned theaters, you had black acting companies. Um, you famously have Art Tatum uh, come after the after the beginnings of the Great Migration, Art Tatum becomes one of the most famous uh, pianists in America, and he comes right out of the Door Pinewood neighborhood. The, the, um, in St. Louis, in Washington, D.C., Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Chicago, you have jazz scenes, blues scenes, um, acting and, and dramatics and musicals and everything else. It's, it's happening everywhere. And I think we do a disservice when we only focus on the Harlem part of the Harlem Renaissance, when in fact this was a nationwide movement of which Harlem was the most prominent. Cultural explosion. This is, I think, a really big deal. And I hope you guys make the same connections I do here. The work of black artists influences all Americans in profound ways. It's not like jazz is only being listened to by black people. It's being listened to by lots of people. All right. Blues is not just being listened to by black people. It's being listened to by lots of people. Jazz is introduced to the mass markets through radio. Um, it is, it moves or is stolen by white artists throughout the 1920s who then get on the radio playing it. And then some black Art, artists are going to have breakthroughs like Duke Ellington um, and their style is going to be widely copied by other artists. Another thing that I think is really interesting, I hope you've heard of Josephine Baker, who was a, a singer and actress. Um, Josephine Baker's fashion sense really defines the 1920s. Um, and 
Baker especially, but other African-American people, including men who were wearing larger suits that became known as zoot suits, um, black fashion becomes the template for the world. Um, young people around the world want to dress in the fashions that they're seeing come out of these new thriving African-American communities in the North. And that's a pattern that I think really continues to this day. Um, maybe I'm really off base here and you guys will correct me, I'm sure. But I feel like in my lifetime, I have definitely seen that a lot of trends that start in the African-American community really spread out into the rest of the country eventually. All right, let's finish up talking about Toledo and um, look at the population numbers here. Now, first I have to tell you, where did I get these numbers? I got them from Ella P. Stewart. Ella Stewart delivered a speech in the mid thirties about the history of Toledo's black community and she had population numbers. Um, it's, it's one of those things, Ella Stewart contributed so much to this city in so many different ways. And one of them was by being a historian. Um, in 1900, there were about 1,700 black people in Toledo. By 1930, there are 13,000. If you guys think about that for just a minute, that's almost a tenfold increase, like a 10 times increase in 30 years. It's enormous and it only gets bigger after 1930. The depression slows down the great migration a little bit, but in 1940, it accelerates again with World War II. Um, the Pinewood District and all along door, as I said, was the heart of Black Toledo. And you don't have to look hard today to find remnants of that history. Um, the Indiana Avenue Y still exists on Indiana Avenue, but it's called something else today. And I cannot remember for the life of me what it's called. But you'll notice on Indiana Avenue, it's a big brick building. On the south side of Indiana Avenue, it has two doors. One says men, one says boys, because it's the old YMCA. And the Indiana Avenue Y was one of two really critically important community organizations right along Indiana Avenue in that neighborhood. Um, during World War II, the uh, USO for black servicemen is going to be located at the Indiana Avenue Y. There's going to be dances there and leagues there and all kinds of other things that are providing recreation and social services for the community. Other one that's even more historic than that is what I have the picture on the left here. This building no longer exists, and boy, do I wish it did. This is the original Frederick Douglass Center, uh, which was also, I believe, on Indiana Avenue. Um, the original Frederick Douglass Center was the first real black community center, and they brought in speakers from around the country, black speakers from around the country. They brought in um, like job coaches to help people get jobs. They did job training programs there other kinds of educational programs, social services. Frederick Douglass did everything in the first half of the 20th century for black people in Toledo. Um, the picture on the right is one of my favorite pictures I've ever seen out of the old Frederick Douglass. Um, this was the ukulele club from the Frederick Douglass Community Center. And you see it's a bunch of ladies who had taken ukulele classes and were learning to play as a ukulele band. This is from 1928, right in the heart of the Great Migration. And I just I just love that. I, I say this all the time. If I had a time machine, I would love to go back to this time in this neighborhood and just learn more. Um, because this is the birth of a thriving, amazing community that persists to this day. Guys, thanks for sticking with me today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And be well.